If you're not careful, you can still fall into the trap of believing that folding phones are a brand new, bleeding edge technology. But then maybe you see the four at the end of these model names, or you end up in a bleary-eyed deep dive into videos like mine. And you realize that it was almost three years ago that I showed you how much Samsung's first Galaxy Fold helped me out when I was searching for my first New York City apartment. My time with that review device turned out to be so transformative that I bought my very own Galaxy Fold in January 2020. And two sequels later, I've never gone back to a conventional phone for my personal device. Today, it's the Galaxy Fold 3 that's helping me seek out a new Brooklyn apartment, if I can afford it, and the Galaxy Flip 3 that helps me unwind when I need to close the lid on Street Easy for a while. So yes, in this video, I will share my first impressions after an hour with the Galaxy Fold 4 and Galaxy Flip 4, but first, my long-term review of a year spent on the Fold 3 and Flip 3. The high points that made me stick with them, despite the stumbles I hope Samsung will fix. To understand how my personal Flip 3 and Fold 3 have aged over the past year, you need to understand, one, that they are personal devices, meaning I bought them, they're not review units, and two, how I've treated them over the past 12 months, which is to say, like a careless, borderline reckless jerk. I routinely drop my Fold 3 to the tabletop dramatically to punctuate a point, like the bloviating blowhard I can sometimes be. When I close it, I mercilessly mash my thumb into its crease, not caring about potential pixel poking. My Fold has endured sundry, steamy sessions as a shower Spotify speaker and my bath time book buddy, so of course it goes without saying that I've also used it in the rain. My Flip 3 has dealt with even more abuse. Nearly every time I use it, I open it with a Shatnerian flick of the wrist that's much less gentle than the robots Samsung uses to test these things. I throw the flip in my bag alongside SIM tools, keychains, and ballpoint pens, and I let it fall off chairs and tabletops because I always forget how damn slippery the thing is. Because I use the flip so often in its freestanding tripod flex mode, its back bears the scars of this abuse. I've even used it to take selfies in a downpour in a muddy river, which got some grit into the hinge that stayed there for like a week. Eventually, it just worked itself out. I'm not trying to say these things are indestructible. You'll notice some wiggling in my Fold 3 sample videos that are probably a result of my abuse having damaged the optical stabilization. The Galaxy subreddits are replete with tales of failed and failing displays, while my own DMs and mentions have several accounts of Samsung service and repair efforts falling flat, to say the least. In fact, I got my own opportunity to test those efforts back in the spring. Here's what happened. My Fold 3 had developed a subtle display discoloration in the crease, subtle enough that I couldn't capture it on camera. And by the end of May, the factory screen protector had started peeling away at the edge. I wanted to check out my options, so I logged into Samsung's At Your Service portal, and that made me chase down a bunch of receipts to retrieve my proof of purchase. After that, I got an error message that said, not a valid model. No further explanation, no steps to take, no other support available. Oh, and uh, the at your service login prompt would not clear on my phone until I lied to it. So far, just a trash experience. So I gave Samsung a call instead, and this went better. The rep told me it would be a warranty repair with no charge down at my local you break I fix. Great. But when I went down there, they didn't have replacement screen protectors in stock, nor any idea when they might arrive. At this point, a certain amount of uh, geographic luck kicked in because rather than being forced to mail my phone to Samsung be without it for a week, I happen to live in one of the very few places an alternative repair option is available. Manhattan's Meatpacking District is home to one of the few Samsung repair centers, which on the day I visited was set up in a mobile office outside of the main Samsung 837 store. I ran into a Mr. Mobile subscriber and fellow Galaxy owner who was also waiting for a repair. Hi, Ron. It was nice chatting with you. And then I handed over both my Fold 3 and my Flip 3 to the technician, since I'd noticed on the way over that the screen protector on my Flip was also starting to get a little ragged. 
After 90 minutes of slinging emails at the coffee shop down the street, I returned to two freshly fixed phones for free, since they were under warranty. I was told that if I wanted another replacement, it would cost 20 bucks. That's a smoother repair than I expected, but it still wasn't great. I would later realize that the technician misapplied my Folds screen protectors when the fingerprint fragment he inadvertently left behind blossomed into this ugly bubble. And around the same time, I noticed the couple of trapped dust specks that were fading in on the cover film. More importantly, if I didn't live in New York, I'd have waited much longer for You Break I Fix to get parts. And if I didn't live in the States, from what I've seen, I might have had a true nightmare of an experience. An expensive phone is only as good as the support that comes with it. And Samsung will have to improve here if it wants to continue the early success it's found with foldables. While we're discussing disappointments, let's call out a few parts that haven't aged well. There's no telephoto camera at all on the flip, and uh, no telephoto worth talking about on the fold. Spoiler alert, at least one of these will be improved in the new phones I'm going to show you shortly. In addition, the camera now takes much longer to start up on my fold for some reason. As you can see from the comically bad frame rate in this video, I rushed to capture of a float plane doing a real cowboy landing in my local Superfund site of Newtown Creek. The flip has always run hot, to the point where I have to keep it open when I'm using it as a hot spot, and its battery life has always been awful. And the Fold 3's battery has gotten steadily worse over the past year. On a recent flight, I started off with a full tank at 8.30 a.m., was down to 69% by the time I taxied onto the LaGuardia tarmac, and by the time we were on approach to Chicago at 2 p.m., I was already down to 27%. And finally, the crease on each of these has gotten tougher to ignore over time because the competition keeps improving. Just look at the Oppo Find N or the Vivo X Fold. Spoiler alert again, this is not something Samsung seems to have been able to improve on the fourth generation, probably because those competitors aren't even offered for sale in the US. Hey, Motorola, Honor, TCL, BBK, anytime you'd like to re-inject some competition into the American foldable market, we're we're ready for you. So why put up with all those added hassles? Well, as I feel like I've said on every episode of this series, it's because these devices give you a smartphone experience no other product does. When I reviewed the Fold 3, I showcased this four-pocket laptop concept with keyboard and mouse accessories. And on a more recent road trip video, I used the Fold as a full-on replacement laptop with Samsung DeX. Well, it won't surprise you to hear that neither of those has really stuck, but that's not because the Fold can't handle it. The reason I don't often do this is because of how much I can get done on the Fold without any accessories at all. It's its own mini laptop when you need it to be. On that same Chicago flight, I attended a virtual briefing with the Fold, which, yeah, was smaller, but also easier than hauling out my laptop for a short flight. It's also simpler when you roll up to a beautiful little coffee shop only to be hit with one of those insufferable, no computers allowed, talk to your friends signs. And okay, ditch my weird laptop replacement fantasies, and the Fold becomes even more useful. Wherever I've gone for the past year, I've always had a Kindle. I've always had a Netflix or Pluto machine, a little self-standing tripod, a much better selfie camera than anyone else because I can use the main cameras for them, enough canvas to feel less cramped when I'm writing or browsing desktop-sized websites or reading restaurant menus than on literally any other phone sold in the US. And when I'm done, it folds up and goes into my pocket. And as for the Flip 3, well, it's the total opposite. Yes, it's about portability and pocketability, but as I said in my review, this phone is also about fun, and nothing about it has aged better than that. That need to consciously open or close the phone to begin or complete a task adds a touch of nostalgic muscle memory to every interaction. The cover display's video and animated wallpaper support hasn't gotten old, and when you toss in Samsung's bespoke color options, you end up with a phone that's more customizable than any other. Also, I was surprised by the dumb little things I still do with the Flip long after the novelty should have worn off. Like taking voice calls with the hinge half-bent to make it a little banana phone. Or reading those same restaurant QR menus with the phone half-bent on a table. 
It really does make it easier to keep an eye on what's going on if you're tracking an Uber or food delivery, but also, it's just more fun. And then there's all those flex mode selfies. You know, I've really talked these points to death in my various reviews of the Motorola Razr and the earlier Galaxy Flip. So, what do you say we cut that short, head back into the city for a first look at the phones that are slated to replace these? This meeting was officially called a Samsung content capture session, but it could have been a game show called Spot the New Phones. If you don't know what to look for, you might miss it. And you know, that's nothing new. I was around for the jump from Galaxy S3 to Galaxy S4, and Flip and Fold 3 to Flip and Fold 4 is the same incredibly iterative generational shift. The Flip has the fewest changes. It's the same basic hardware offered in new colors, buffed to a shine on the sides and slimmed down very slightly, about one and a half millimeters in one axis and less than a millimeter in the other. There's still a gap when it's closed. Both displays are the same dimensions. The cameras have mostly the same specs with improvements to stabilization, focus, and night mode performance with, uh, according to Samsung, a 65% brighter sensor, which I'm trying to learn more about. Like the Fold, it gets an upgrade to Gorilla Glass Victus Plus for the casing and keeps the armor aluminum. There's Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 under the hood, but the biggest upgrades from a day-to-day -day perspective are a battery that's 12% bigger, which charges 14% faster, and a cover display that lets you make calls, send quick replies, generally do more when the phone is closed. Samsung says it's also working with partners like Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and more to make the phone perfect for vlogging on the go with custom flex mode functionality and built-in filters. Also, flex mode panel has gotten more features for apps that aren't optimized, including a new trackpad, which should be really fun to try out. I might get more excited about the whole package when I see it actually delivered, but even then, I'm going to hope all these software features also come to Flip 3 owners because there's really no technical reason they shouldn't. On to the Fold 4. It boasts the same Snapdragon and Gorilla Glass Victus Pluses and packs them into a chassis that's 8 grams lighter and about 3 millimeters wider, both when closed and when open. That leads to a tiny aspect ratio tweak of the 7.6-inch display that you only notice when you put it side by side with the old one, although the new screen is said to be 45% stronger, with an enhanced adhesive on the PET screen protector to prevent the kind of lifting I saw on my Fold 3. The camera housing is identical to last year, but don't let that fool you. Only the ultra-wide camera remains unchanged. The borderline useless 2X telephoto of last year has at least been replaced with a 3X module, while the main camera has been upgraded to a 50 megapixel sensor, still f over 1.8. Meanwhile, on the inner screen, the selfie shooter sits beneath a 40% denser display duck blind. But I can still see the thing pretty easily, and it's still got the same poor 4 megapixel resolution from last year. And Samsung will only say that it maintained the camera's photo quality, so don't expect any miracles here. Besides the similar software optimizations for multitasking and flex mode, and the relocation of the power user taskbar to the bottom of the screen, that's about it for upgrades on the Fold. The battery is the same size. It's compatible with the same S pens, but I never used those because there's no silo on the phone. And the hinge is less pronounced, but only if you're really looking for it. So maybe it's no surprise that the price will be the same as last year, too. When they go on sale August 26th, the Fold 4 will start at $17.99, and Flip 4 will kick off at $9.99, or $10.99 for the bespoke edition. And when people say, holy hell, that's a lot of money, of course, I have to admit, they're right. And given the similarities between Generation 3 and 4, I also have to admit it's a little disappointing. I mean, I've certainly crucified the iPhone for less. So while I continue to think that Samsung isn't innovating as quickly as it could, or maybe should, I also get the sense that these new devices will probably still be worth it, even if they're not that exciting.
I'll, of course, be reviewing both of these in dedicated videos, and when I do, don't be surprised to see dbrand on them. They're more than my sponsor. They're the skins that have protected my phones from drops, scrapes, and looking boring since before Mr. Mobile was even a thing. And speaking of being old, the dbrand leather skin is the perfect complement to the fold for a guy who always wanted to be the moleskin leather notebook type but never had the penmanship for it. So don't carry your slippery foldable naked. Dbrand your device at the link in the description. Stay tuned for those reviews both here and on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want more of my thoughts on flexible screen devices from the flip to the fold to the <laughs> ridiculous, there are 14 other episodes of Into the Fold just waiting for your eyeballs. This hands-on was produced following an hour with Fold and Flip 4 pre-release press units demoed at a Samsung media event and a year with the Fold and Flip 3 purchased by Mr. Mobile. As always, Samsung had no creative control, early preview, or editorial input of any kind, and it provided no compensation for this coverage. Until next time, from Michael Fisher, thanks for watching, and stay mobile, my friends.